Hello, my lovely Rose Garden, and welcome to an enchanting book review. My name is Avalon Roslyn, indie author, and your town uncle for the evening. I think that I've made my feelings about Harry Potter pretty plain at this point, but if you were curious, my disdain for the Wizard Boy books began even before J.K. Rowling named herself Queen of the Turfs. While I adored the books as a child and thought I would lovingly read them to my own child one day, hindsight is, as they say, 2020. And now I'm able to identify how frequently Harry Potter left even low hanging fruit of interesting plot developments to rot on the ground. Which leaves many of us who grew up loving the series with a question. What can we give to our own children that recalls the same fantastical wonder and adventure without all the baggage and less-than-magical writing. Clarabelle Ortega's Witchlings might well be the answer to that conundrum. In the world of Witchlings, young witches are sorted into houses and form covens of five to focus their magic and gain access to more powerful spells. Seven Salazar is determined to get into House Hyacinth, known for its legendary writers and reporters, with her best friend Poppy. Instead, she's a spare, not assigned to any house and doomed to access only base-level magic. She refuses to accept this, and because she refuses to accept it, she faces an even worse fate alongside her coven mates Thorn and Valley. If they can't seal their coven, they'll lose their magic entirely and be witchlings forever. Terrified of that prospect, Seven invokes the impossible task one last-ditch attempt to save what magical ability she can, and the three are tasked with bringing down a terrifying monster called the Night Beast. Right away, one thing that I deeply appreciate about this book is the layers and layers of world-building. The reader is thrown right into this magical world and information is revealed naturally and largely through character interactions, which infuse the book with personality. And, not to get into the spoiler section now or anything, but the primary conflict of the book ties into that world building, which I found highly rewarding for paying attention to small details early on. Another thing I like about this book is that Seven is sometimes wrong. Like, very wrong. Her initial interactions with several characters show that Seven has a lot to learn about how she views others and getting over her preconceived ideas about them, learning to be less self-centered and consider others' opinions and feelings before she acts. This is apparent in her treatment of Thorn when they first meet, and the assumptions she makes about her arch-nemesis Valley. Rather than find Seven to be annoying or unlikable, I recognized her as a young person making mistakes that she acknowledges and works to correct later. It's more realistic and gives her character room to grow. I also have to say I love the trio of Seven, Thorn, and Valley. They're all very different personalities with wildly different skill sets. Seven is a highly talented, book-smart witch capable of using spells far above her level. Thorn is shy and has practical skills like sewing magical cloaks and having general knowledge of events around the Twelve Towns and Valley is a rough-and-tumble monster expert who isn't afraid to get her hands dirty. Witchlings presents a trio of protagonists who leap off the page, grab the reader by the hand, and lead them into a lively, fun, and sometimes dangerous world of magic and monsters. The website also does this by providing an official quiz to find out which of the houses you would be in. According to the official quiz, I am in the Frog House, focused, frugal, and truthful to the last. And, as a witch myself, I enjoyed the bits of actual witchcraft knowledge that was sprinkled in alongside the purely fictional fantasy lore. There is a clear respect for real witches, without including details that might get a child looking to imitate the characters into trouble. And I know this is kind of out of left field, but as I was reviewing my script, I couldn't find anywhere else to put it. The representation. There is so much diversity in this book, from racial diversity in the main and supporting cast to the myriad of LGBTQ identities shown throughout the book. 
There really is something to say for how inclusive writing makes the world feel more real, at least for someone like me who grew up in a culturally diverse area and knows a ton of people who aren't cishet. I'm really glad that young readers have books like this that just acknowledge the existence of people who historically haven't been centered in books. While romance is definitely not a focus of the story in this installment, my guess is that at least one or two of the Spare Coven members are probably LGBT, and this might be explored further in future books. So to answer the question at the beginning of the video, is Witchlings a contender for those who still want to read books like Harry Potter, but don't want to continue supporting a bigoted author who very much does take the continued relevance of the series as an endorsement of her views? Most definitely yes. I would highly recommend this book to any reader, young or old, who is looking to recapture a little bit of fantasy, mystery, and adventure in their life, especially as the truth of what is happening in the Twelve Towns is revealed. Which means it's time to get to the spoiler section of the review. If you are leaving the video now, please remember to leave a like and subscribe for more content like this. I make videos about the books I read and the books I write, and your support really makes a difference for an indie author like me. If you're interested in supporting me even further, please consider buying my books or becoming a patron. You can find the links to my website, Patreon, Ko-fi, and social media accounts in the description. All right, let's talk spoilers. A major recurring issue throughout the book, from the inciting incident to several minor difficulties the characters encounter throughout the impossible task, is the discrimination towards spares. Because spares are barred from higher level magic, they are basically relegated to being servants of the wealthy and are mistreated constantly by their employers because of their reliance upon them. It comes as no surprise when the spare trio, upon doing some more research about the night beast and the cuckoo attacks that plague the twelve towns past and present, come across a conspiracy to strip spare rights even further and put bigoted members of the town council in charge. The fact that they themselves were used as pawns in order to accomplish this especially stings. I was already interested in the Night Beast based on its elusive nature and how Seven, Valley, and Thorn had to learn to work together using their unique combination of talents to bring the beast down. It was already an intriguing monster with engaging lore and presented a real challenge that qualifies defeating one for something called the impossible task. Finding out that the Night Beast's presence was just one part of the challenges facing the protagonists and that the real villain is motivated by classism and greed elevated this book for me. The discussion was definitely there already, but this twist brought it to the forefront and really put on display how far some people will go to preserve their power and social status, and it definitely felt relevant to current events. I was not as big a fan of the second twist, being that the original spares who were turned into toads, the aptly referred to cursed toads, were the real villains all along. This twist is not without merit, especially as it relates to Seven's early characterization. The cursed toads were angry at being spares and refused to accept it, meaning that they, like Seven, caused their coven binding to fail, leading to the impossible task being invoked. Only unlike Seven, Valley, and Thorn, the cursed toads did not accept being spares even after they completed their task. They wanted more power, and their internalized hatred of spares, and the Grand for making them spares, led them to commit horrible acts of forbidden magic, such as hexing the night beast into obeying them and altering people's memories to forget the cursed toads. They impersonated the town uncles, leading the real uncles to be turned into toads in their place, and used their power and influence to further discriminatory action against spares. The difference is that through her own journey, Seven came to truly appreciate her coven of spares and is now on the path to fighting for equality instead of being consumed by hatred. I just wish that this twist had been foreshadowed a little better 
or had more time to be developed, since the reveal comes pretty late into the book. If I reread Witchlings again knowing the twist, I would probably be able to pick up on a few more hints here and there, such as the fact that the imposters are using the uncle's ability to talk to animals to help them control the night beast, but it was far from my favorite aspect of the book, and I was more interested in the Dimblewits and Mr. Pepperhorn's actions as antagonists, showing that even normal people with prejudiced views can be the biggest threat of all. Despite this, the ending was satisfying. The Night Beast, rather than be killed, is treated as another victim of the situation and safely preserved in a warded area of the forest. Seven's immense power is revealed to be because she is the next town uncle and can talk to animals, which is part of how the Night Beast is handled. Valley's mom is now in the process of divorcing Valley's abusive father, and the two are living more happily away from him and Valley is receiving counseling for her anger issues while she processes things. Thorne has avenged her brother's death, and her family shop is thriving. I know there is a sequel, The Golden Frog Games, and I'd be happy to give it a read when I can grab it in paperback. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the review. If you'd please put a crystal ball emoji in the comments, and tell me which house you were sorted into on the official Witchlings website. I'll leave a link in the description so you can find it easily. I hope at least a few of you are in the frog house with me, but they're all great, and none of them are the designated villain group. Thank you so much for watching, and a special thank you to my patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or in the description below, please consider joining my Patreon. Your support means so much to me and allows me to continue making content. If you want to support my content in different ways, consider buying my books, donating on coffee, subscribing to the channel, or even just giving this video a like and comment. Any and everything is appreciated so much. Keep growing till next time, Rose Garden!